how we pay them. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, stay here if you want to hear about FreeBSD uh, scale out operations. Um, just a quick shout out to the other Limelight folks here. Um, I'm the guy at the top, Kevin Bowling. Uh, Sean is here, source committer. Hiran is somewhere, uh, another source committer. Uh, Jason is some, Jason's back there, um, and Chris is back there as well. Um, various roles at Limelight on engineering side, and Johannes is a contractor for us doing uh, some cool stuff with stats and the Linux ports. Um, so we that, that's actually the more or less the totality of our BSD effort. We've got a couple other people, and, and I'll touch on, on that in a little bit. Um, so just an introduction to what Limelight is. We are a CDN, and this is a cute graphic our marketing folks came up with. Um, basically what we do is put servers close to users. So these um, are in uh, data centers that are rich with eyeball networks and, and uh, backhaul. Um, we run our own fiber backbone. This actually differentiates us from most other CDNs, uh, which are generally going over um, you know, internet transit or uh, some type of carriers. You know, if they're putting, uh, for instance, their appliance in an ISP location, they have to backhaul over the ISP's network. Um, so this kind of lets us get, a, get over the, you know, the turbulence of the internet. We can also accelerate uh, non-cacheable content uh, via the, our, our, our backbone. Um, we do have some other services aside from content delivery. We do uh, video, so we've got a pretty comprehensive um, system around that. It's basically like a private YouTube that you can drop into a site. Uh, a lot of um, local news channels, for instance, use this. Um, let's see, we've also got object storage. Um, this is similar to S3. It's much more targeted to, to being an origin for our caching service. But people do use that as a generic uh, storage, uh, basically an S3 type of, of object storage. Um, we've got a DDoS attack uh, mitigation that can either be used a, with our content delivery products or as a uh, network defense um, as long as we can take control of, of the, IP, the front end IPs. Um, so as far as numbers go, we're somewhere north of 10 terabits of, of egress at this point uh, of, of actual bandwidth um, and that's peering, transit, paid, paid peering. Um, so we're we're pretty big uh, in the in the CDN market. We're generally between one and three, depending. Uh, well, I, I don't think we've ever been one, but number two or three, um, depending on the the time of year. Um, and we have somewhere north of a hundred data centers. Um, so again, these are you know just pops in large metro areas with lots of fiber and, and hopefully lots of eyeball networks. So a pop um, looks pretty not, you know, there, there's not a lot going on inside of them in, in terms of, of like the equipment. We've got DWM gear. This uh, basically runs a local fiber loop between, generally we don't go into one data center in a metro area, we'll have two or three. Uh, the DWM gear lets us, you know, over a single um, pair of fibers cram like 10, uh, 10 gigabit lines. Um, so that creates a loop between the, we basically treat all of those data centers as one point of presence. Um, and we do get a little bit of redundancy out of that, but that's how that works. Um, at, the, uh, at the actual data centers, we have a pair of, of generally uh, the, the largest routers you can get from somebody like Brocade with a full route table. Um, and this is what our peers are coming into and our transit. Um, behind that, we'll either have a couple or more large chassis switches. Um, you know, these look just like the routers. They're like half, three quarters of a rack with tons and tons of uh, 10 gig ports going out to the systems. Or we're pulling 40 off to uh, a, a spine network 
Um, generally, we're using Arista 40 gig switches here, uh, and those will go to top of rack switches. Um, it, there are pros and cons to both approaches. Uh, price usually dictates which we do, uh, as well as the size of the pop. Then we've got a ton of servers that look just like this. Um, a lot of people use Supermicro, we're in that camp. Um, we generally throw one CPU into these. Uh, you know, this is good for FreeBSD because we don't have NUMA problems. Uh, you, you know, there's, no, there's just a, a single NUMA node. Um, we're using all SSDs at this point on these edge boxes. Um, we've used some Samsung. I think we've evaluated Micron as well. Um, so all of those bays will be uh, generally 480s at this point. We're looking at going up to terabyte class SSDs uh, because that affects our cache retention time, um, which lets us, for, for long tail content, we can get faster throughput uh, the more space we have. Um, so on the back of this thing, uh, it's actually two servers. Um, in the 2U, the reason we do this is we get four extra drives in the 2U versus 1U servers. Um, it does cause some problems with asset management. Uh, we've mostly worked that out, but for instance, if you pull one of those nodes and put a new one in, how do you handle that? It's, it's a pain. Um, but it's worth it for the four extra drives. Uh, so on the back, generally we've got, um, at this point we're using Intel 10 gig uh, fiber ethernet. Uh, it drops into this I think this little guy right here. Um, we're trying to work with Chelsea right now and see if we can get uh, a, a Chelsea board to go into this thing because if you don't populate the second CPU socket on these super micro boards, you don't get to use these, unfortunately. Um, sure. I don't track that. Uh, nobody on my team does either. We're a little bit higher, higher level than that, but I would assume so. Um, we're trying to get more and more efficient, so that will be you know, part, of, a part of the effort. But at this point, it's purely performance driven. It, it's, we can do so much more with the SSDs. It does, but SSDs have dropped to the point where it's, they're big enough and cheap enough that it, it doesn't matter. We don't, you know, we're in we're in colos. Um, we only have a couple of our own data centers, so we don't care too much about that as long as the data center does a good job. Um, so, again, the the point of this talk, uh, what why, what actually motivated me to do this was a lot of people talk about embedded use. There's a lot of appliance vendors talking about FreeBSD, but I haven't seen a lot of people talking about large-scale installations. And there, there are uh, a few of those out there. So I, I want to just show you what we do, and, and hopefully um, people can learn or, or be motivated to come and talk about their own stuff. So the main difference between a, you know, an ops type of workload and an appliance workload is the systems are very fluid. These things are changing quite regularly in both in, in terms of software and in terms of configuration. Um, we're pushing configuration several times a day, either for customer turnups or to test new packages or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and this is very common. This is all of the hot stuff you see at startups and whatnot. This is like large websites, API-centric companies, and, and service providers. Um, they, they're all in this category of, of ops, I would, I would say. And with that, the workload is basically internet-facing. You don't have um, you know, we're not like a, a storage appliance that has to have 100% availability because a ton of servers are hanging off of it. Um, we've got lots of cheap nodes and, and we can kind of deal with failure in, in different ways. So um, this is more or less the about me. Uh, I think it's kind of important before we get to the other slides. I was a Linux guy for 10 plus years and, and very deep into that culture. Um, and, you know, although I was doing that pro professionally, I kind of played around with other operating systems. Um, I ran MonoWall when I was, you know, still in high school, and that was a thing. Uh, switched to PFSense um, when that started gaining traction. And I would play around with other OSs just for fun. Um, I'm kind of curious about, you know, the design trade-offs and, and why people do things. Uh, I also like old hardware. Uh, 
kind of played a role with those ones at the end. Um, so I start at Limelight Networks, and I'm, I'm intrigued by the BSD edge because this is like our bread and butter. Um, there's over 10,000 machines, and there's not a lot of people doing anything to make that happen. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because like on the Linux side, either at Limelight or other companies I've been at, there's a ton of people per, you know, whatever measurement you want to use per, you know, X number of servers. At Limelight, that wasn't the case. There was maybe a handful of people really involved in the design and, and implementation of, of the CDN. And that, uh, that kind of piqued my interest and got me going in on, on this stuff. Um, and you know, when I started digging, what I found was this BSD software and mindset were really responsible for that, and that sucked me in. So um, I'll try and explain more of that in my talk as I'm talking about some of the tools we use, and hopefully that makes little sense, more sense. But one motif um, to keep in the back of your mind when I'm doing this, uh, observability trumps everything else. And this is kind of uh, stolen, I think, from Brennan Gregg. Um, he meant it, I think, in the context of you know, tracing and, and figuring out how software works, but I've actually, I, I think it's even in deeper than that. We were talking about how BSD pulls you into the source tree and you, for instance, know how your compiler, at least what it is and what it's you know, calling out in terms of other uh, utilities last night. Um, in the base system, you know, you know what's part of your distribution. It's not just this substrate that you're trying to fire up JVMs on top of and be done with it. You actually kind of get involved in your operating system. Um, so I'll dive into some of our tool choice. These are pretty airy slides, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, but we use Zabbix. Uh, we're generally happy with it. Um, it was somewhat hard to scale uh, because it uses a relational database uh, to keep track of all these incoming values. So the answer to that was Fusion IO. We run um, MySQL on top of Fusion IO and it works well enough for the, the current workload. Um, the key insight here though, aside, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say use Zabbix uh, unless you're a small or medium shop. It's a little bit pushing it for what we're doing, but use an API driven monitoring system. Um, there's a couple out there, uh, or more than that, but j make sure that the way you're interacting with your monitoring system isn't like writing config files manually. You wanna be pushing configuration into this um, and that should ideally be part of your configuration management uh, toolbox. And I'll, I'll get to that when I talk about salt. Um, operationally, monitoring has to be part of your entry into production. If you have people putting stuff customer facing up without monitoring, you're gonna have a bad time. I mean, you're gonna have problems and there's gonna be this you know, fire drill and then you're gonna wonder why you didn't do that to begin with. Uh, this is something we've learned a few times over I think we've gotten a little bit better at it recently. Um, and then the other thing where we want to go is getting monitoring as part of our testing in QA. You know, a lot of people write QA uh, toolkits or what have you, um, you know, to run unit tests or integration tests. But when you're doing ops, you actually need to think beyond just the piece of software. You need to think about how it's deployed and how it integrates with, you know, other microservices or databases, whatever the case may be. Uh, the answer that we think is, you know, plug it into monitoring. That's what's going to tell you when something's wrong in production. Um, if you can catch those errors, you know, as part of QA, then you have a nice little feedback loop. Um, and, you know, just as part of this, don't use Nagios anymore. It's not very good. We can do better than that as an industry. Um, so opposite of monitoring, uh, is metrics and this is more or less time series data coming into uh, some type of scalable database. Um, we have TSDB in place right now. I'm not really happy with it. I was involved in, in trying to uh, un-FSCK it a few times and didn't get very far, but um, I, I liked, I was talking to Sean Chittenden, he's a Groupon guy here at BSD Can, and he's like, so basically what you have is a metric dumping ground. We have something that's easy to put a ton of data into and not really anything to get good stuff out of it. Um, so I think there are better answers here. 
One of the things we've been experimenting with is a startup called Jet. Uh, it's kind of a hybrid hosted on-site application. Um, this guy in the back, Chris, Chris, can tell you all about it if you're interested. But it's actually pretty cool. It's a data flow language, which is something that's been around. Uh, data flow programming has been around for a long time. But they kind of put it right here in your face. Um, so if you've ever used Splunk, it's just next level beyond that. Um, so for instance, you can you know query some type of, uh, for instance, here they're showing querying an asset database. And basically, the question was, you know, using these metrics like our average response time and our uh, kilobits per second, how can we see how our different hardware models are influencing that? So, in this example, you know, this particular device is doing quite a bit better than these other devices. And you know, you, somebody looking at this could make a case to say, well, we should deploy a lot of these and deprecate these because that wins us business or whatever. Um, so metrics is a, a pretty important thing for making decisions at scale. Um, I can talk a lot more about this, or I can move on if anybody's interested. Uh, so basically what we're trying to do, we, we feed a ton of just you know, stats coming off a server. So um, our main ingest is a, a program called Collect D. It's just a C agent with plugins. Um, and this is looking at things like you know, your CPU usage, load average, um, GSTAT on FreeBSD, uh, memory. And then we try and get application metrics too. This requires you know, the application developers to get involved, but they can push up things like transactions per second or you know, average uh, some type of percentile response or, or things like that. Once we get it into one of these systems, then we can query it. Um, this is actually the, the bare bones TSDB interface. There are some better ones, uh, Grafana. Um, but basically, then what you do is try and correlate things. So you can say, you know, this is actually a, a brilliant example. It's like, can I correlate server model to response time? But maybe I want to look at, um, you know, backbone saturation to response time or. Uh, swap in versus response time, things like that. There, you know, when, when you have the data, you can start asking questions. Um, and you can, with them in a, a scalable database, you can ask them post facto. So you don't lose that you know, after an incident. You can go back and say, why did we do something wrong or, or you know, imperfectly there? Um, yes? Sure, so I, I said it's not quite metrics um, because basically both of these things are taking in log data. Um, for instance, you're pushing in syslog or app logs. Um, then they have indexers that you know, can, can put that into an efficient uh, structure so you can query it and roll it up into different things. A lot of times you can turn that back into metrics. So. For instance, we can use Splunk to uh, get metrics off of, you know, like an access log or something. Or um, Elk is more or less the same, uh, more or less equivalent to Splunk, uh, just you know, open source. Um, trying to think, you know, the other thing you can do here is is just query your, you know, if you if you are looking for like, uh, for instance, a panic or, or something that's coming off a of syslog. You can go into Splunk and try and you know make inductions based off of that, like you know try and correlate things, kernel version or, or things like that. Does that so help? That is kind of more or less um, actual, like an adios replacement, not not for alerting, but in terms of getting metrics off of the system. These two are more textual. They're really it's how do you deal with logs at scale? You know, a person can't go view the syslog output of 10,000 servers. It's just overwhelming. So what you try and do is get it, all, you know, get it into here and then look for anomalies or create uh, you know, canned searches that know certain bad conditions, things like that. It's, it's not, you, know, you can use that to then feed an alarm into your monitoring system, um, but by itself, it's, it's very free form. It's, just a, it's, it's like a search index for text. 
Um, I'll go ahead and move on then. So this is uh, something we've invested a lot of work into in the past year. Um, we were a CF Engine 2 shop, uh, and then we had some chef through acquisitions. Um, but we did kind of a bake-off, and we, we, we looked at what was out there and, and what would work for our implementation, and we found SALT. And we've been pretty pleased with this decision. Um, the key insight with SALT is that you have configuration management built on top of an orchestration bus. So rather than running your CM system on a scheduler or a cron, you actually have agents permanently running on, on the systems, and then they're always connected to these master systems. So this is kind of interesting. You can react to different events. For instance, when CM runs on one system and something changes, that can push something over the bus and make something else happen. For instance, add a host to a load balancer or something in real time. You don't have to do this on, on synchronous uh, schedules. So I gave a talk at SaltConf where we go really deep into um, how we deal with changes to the CM system itself. We basically have a workflow where um, we have you know, a steady state CM, and then when somebody wants to change that policy, we spin up a new salt master in a container and then let them point their machines to that and verify it you know, in, in, a, in a sandbox environment or even in production for certain changes. Um, and when that's ready, that's then accepted and, and promoted into that steady state. Um, this has been pretty cool. So basically what you're trying to do with configuration management, if this is new to you, um, is move system state from something like shell scripts or interactive input into declarations. You want to describe what a machine is, you know, what a machine is supposed to do rather than step by step how it is to do it. And then let the, the system figure out what's changed or what needs to be changed and what order it needs to happen in to make it do a thing. So um, basically policy is greater than implementation with, with configuration management. Um, with SALT or with most systems, you can, get, you can do things programmatically when you need to. One of the key insights is you kind of want to build those programmatic structures up so then you can use them in your declarations, and, and SALT makes this really easy. Um, this is a, a state that deploys network time or NTPD, um, and using a map file, this works on our FreeBSD hosts, our Red Hat hosts, and our Ubuntu hosts. Uh, so that's kind of what you can do with CM. You can abstract things out a little bit and make, make it easy to understand what a host is doing at an abstract level. Uh, the other thing we, we get with SALT is this orchestration bus. So um, a kind of neat example we had recently, we ran into some weirdness in the TCP stack where we have a customer with a very bad network that's uh, sending out-of-order packets in the initial burst. Um, and then it's actually sending acts left of the window. And it's ac there's actually an RFC that none of us knew about where this is supposed to be a good thing. Um, so we found, uh, basically, we wanted to see how prevalent this was in production to, to gauge the severity. So we wrote a dtrace script and actually ran this on 2,000 production machines and you know, just watched a counter for 10 minutes. And we found out it, it's actually very, very rare. So um, that helped us kind of triage a bug you know, from, oh, oh, wow, this is, you know, we better get a handle on this real quick to, OK, you know, we can take our time and figure out what's actually going on here and, and how do we want to fix that. Um, should I pause here on SALT? Do you want any questions or comments? Yes, we do. Um, so we've got, I'm trying to think of, of a good example. So we sync SSH keys out to the edge. This is just one I wrote, so it's on the top of my head. Um, to do that, we just, the, the module goes and makes a LDAP query um, for the SSH attribute in the directory, and then pumps that to the master. Then the master can use the salt file server to push that out to our edge nodes. It's just a way we log into our systems. Um, we've also written modules to do like different services. I, can, I can't think of, um, one of them is, is actually this workflow, like how this thing spins up containers. That's a, a module. Uh, 
couple screen pools at most. It's easy. I, I, I'm really pleased with Salt. Everything's pretty straightforward. The, the docs are a little bit hard to get started, but once you kind of grok it, it's pretty easy to, to keep going. Very little, very, very little. Um, it's zero MQ underneath right now, and they're actually working to get, make an even more optimized transport. Um, but like as far as bandwidth, there's no noticeable. I mean, I think the machine's been up for, with these, with a large client count, and it's done like 100 gigs over a couple months of. How many clients do you have in Texas? So we have like 1,500 servers. I'm just trying to get an idea. Sure. So we've got one master, just a single master right now with a total of like 2,000 hosts on it. And then we've got a couple other pools, but, um, and that's doing fine. Like that's, uh, handling all the encryption and everything, and you know, it, you'll see the CPU spike a little bit. Like you don't want to to skimp on on hardware there, but it's for that. I think you'll be all right. Uh, we've got dual. So we we went dual CPU, um, uh, whatever the current generation is, like eight core, dual eight core, and then like a hundred RAM. It actually didn't matter, but we've got like 128 in there. Um, we also did SSDs just because it we didn't need a lot of space and they're affordable for us. Sure, so I looked into Ansible on my own. We didn't consider it for uh, work. We looked into Chef, CF Engine 3, and Puppet, uh, aside from Salt. Um, what I saw in Ansible was a lot of the same thing um, but it didn't do the bus thing that we really like. Like that, that's kind of a key insight to us. Um, I think it's a great configuration management system and it's really easy to get started. Their docs are fantastic. It just seemed to me that Salt was a better fit for what we wanted to do. Uh, we didn't see really a tremendous gain like from two to three. What we wanted was easy templating like this. That would actually be a lot lot more stuff in CF Engine 3. And then the ease of writing custom modules. You know, we, we've got a lot of pi people that know Python to varying degrees. Uh, so the entry to changing both the server and the client are pretty low. Uh, most of us that have worked on the SALT implementation have actually been contributing patches, like drive-by patches to the SALT upstream and it's you just go in and do it and you're done for the day. You don't have to have like a, a huge learning curve. That was it. I think that's a key win actually over some of the other systems where they've started, you know, bifurcating the agents in Ruby and now you've got, you know, a closure server or whatever. It, it starts making things harder for casual development. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, so how do we actually get FreeBSD onto our edge machines? This has changed in recent times. Um, we're trying to get a little bit more formal with it because we've got source committers on staff now and we're starting to do more interesting stuff. Um, so basically we, we use Git at Limelight as our version control system. So we're using uh, the, there's a semi-official GitHub mirror of, of uh, the FreeBSD SVN tree. So we have two branches. We have head and stable, um, and these follow you know, SVN head and, and currently 10 stable. And what we're doing here is taking, uh, we're deploying 10 stable, but we develop against head because we want to kind of stay ahead of the curve and make sure you know, that what we're doing is going to be fine when the next release comes along. Um, so we take these two branches and we grind them through a Jenkins job this produces our images that actually go out to the edge. Uh, and I'll kind of go off on a tangent here. Um, we have this vagrant thing that this is actually part of our salt deployment. We're taking these images and pushing them out as vagrant boxes so developers can run this stuff on their laptop. The insight here is we want them to have a very low barrier to entry to writing configuration management and working with our actual production images. You know, 
if you're developing against a vanilla image um, that might not have all of our customizations, maybe you don't run into a problem early enough and it becomes a problem, that kind of thing. So with Vagrant, we're able to actually get very low barrier to entry to our very, uh, you know, very production looking environments. And this is all a big feedback loop. Uh, Packer is a thing that we use to make those box files. It's a little bit more important in the Linux world because we just have these uh, ISO images that we have to enhance with our changes to packages and config. But in FreeBSD, we've got the build system so we can do whatever we need to there. I'll go more into our, our source stuff in a bit. Um, so phase two, after I'd been at Limelight for a little over a year, um, what I kind of saw was that this BSD stuff was, was awesome and, and we needed to do more of it. We needed to be deliberate about it. So we brought on um, Sean uh, and that's been awesome. He's been helping us upstream all the things. So we had a, a stack of patches, not a huge list, not like some of the appliance people, um, but you know, enough to try and get that stuff either fixed upstream or, or at least reported upstream so it could be fixed in a perhaps a better way. Um, and we're trying to get better about how we actually use the ports tree and, and build packages. This is an ongoing thing, but uh, the key here is Podrier and, and PackageNG. Um, these are really awesome. I think they're kind of the best software packaging experience that I've seen uh, on any operating system to date. Um, and, and again, this is all about just being very deliberate about what we're doing. A lot of things that, you know, up until this time were done just because they had to get done and now we're trying to take a look at it and say, okay, here's how we should do it going forward and, and we'll be, you know, more efficient and better. Um, so how did we start a source team? Uh, so for instance, I found Sean on the jobs mailing list. This is uh, pretty low volume, but you can either post you know, your resume there to, or post a, a rec there. Uh, you can come to conferences like this and, and look for people that are doing stuff. And uh, of course, if you do cool stuff sensibly, generally people will come to you. Um, we're trying to do that. I hope we're getting better at that. Um, but there's plenty of people using BSD that are doing that, so. Uh, the benefits of starting the source team were we were on FreeBSD 8 when we started and um, you know 9 had come out, 10 had come out and getting from 8 to 10 was actually a lot more involved than we thought. Even with this small patch stack as an operator, it was quite a bit of work. Um, both because of, you know, there, there were actually bugs in the 10, 10 and 10 one release that we've had to work through. Um, and then we have a binary blob that we actually deploy to production. We bought a pluggable congestion control algorithm before that was a thing in FreeBSD that does some network magic. Um, so we had to kind of figure out how we could keep the interface consistent so we could keep using that in the 10 life cycle while we figure out what we want to keep from that and implement ourselves where we can uh, as, as source changes. Um, some of the other things we've done, uh, Sean worked on this multi-queue EM driver. The EM driver is like a gigabit class uh, Ethernet controller. From Intel, it only uses one NIC queue. Um, and what we saw was that a lot of our machines were actually uh, kind of stuck in the TCP path. Uh, so what he found through reading some of the ARC manuals was that you could split this out to at least two queues on some of the chips. And then now we can get you know, two or more cores, uh, I think two to four cores doing that TCP output path. Um, and this actually got us with the two link ags from like 1.1 gigabits reliably. Now we can more or less max those two interfaces out. Uh, so that was a, a really nice thing. Um, we also started doing some profiling with Dtrace and PMC stat. And we found that we were paying actually a pretty hefty IPFW penalty on our outbound path and we don't have any outbound rules. Um, this is because the, by default, even if you don't have any rules, there's a accept rule uh, and then you have a bunch of setup and teardown with IPFW. So herein uh, added, I think it was like a two line change and we'll probably try and push this upstream if, if people want it. Um, just a control to say ignore 
any IPFW uh, overhead on the outbound path. And we, we got an appreciable gain out of that as well. Uh, Sean did this uh, PLMTUD implementation. This was basically if people are blocking I, uh, ICMP traffic. Okay. So, do you want to? Oh, it makes, makes the network not stop when somebody's blocking in, in, in ICMP. With ICMP. So, this was something that um, I think, I don't know if it was a customer request or something that we just noticed uh, in production, but um, that was a, a cool thing that we got knocked out. Call out NG, this was really fun um, <laughs> for some value of fun. The callout system was broken um, up through 10.1 release, and you don't actually notice this uh, on, you know, if you're running a small fleet of systems, the, the panics that you'll see from this are rare enough. But when we had such a, a, a large number of machines, we could actually daily see machines panicking. Um, so this was, we didn't actually develop the fix, but we were kind of, uh, following along in the review and you know poking people and testing the patches, so we think this is fixed um, in what will uh, ten stable, what will become ten two. Um, so that was actually quite a bit of work just figuring that out. And again, Sean and, and Jason were uh, key in doing that. Um, we're we're looking into TCP customization. A lot of this will go upstream uh, where we can, but some of it might be. Uh, where we're kind of deviating from the spec or whatever. Um, and then we're also doing MFCs of stuff, sometimes early or uh, sometimes if somebody can com commit something to current and they don't, for whatever reason, want to MFC it, we'll pull it back on the upstream project. Um, so some of the insights of, of working with source. We want to always develop against head. We don't want to get into this situation that other vendors have gotten in where they're married to a release, and then they have to do this huge drill to get back to the current release. We want to know what's changing in head while it's changing um, so we can influence that and you know, kind of sound the alarm or, or, or hopefully you know, prevent problems from happening. Uh, so this is our LL head branch. Then we pull those changes back to our LL stable, which is following uh, 10 stable. Um, when we're ready to ship this, we do an internal release engineering process. Basically, this is running our build job, doing some smoke tests, and then deploying it to Canary hosts. And then finally, we'll release this to uh, our systems over a longer period of time. So um, again, one thing I'm kind of reiterating here is these feedback loops. Uh, this thing called the OODA loop is kind of an interesting way to think about it. Um, basically, it's like observe, orient, decide, act. So we want to kind of see what's changing, get ready, you know, position either the people or the machines to do what they need to do, do the work, and then make sure what we did is effective. That's all we're doing on a lot of this stuff, either in, in operations or in, in development. Um, so where I'm at now, uh, what I want to do is kind of identify and support key features and the community at large. So uh, there's a couple ways we, we're trying to do this. We're trying to kind of look out and see what features in FreeBSD we want to either you know, push an agenda on or, or push our resources to implement. Um, we want to support the community with you know, finances. So we've made a donation to the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, internally, we want to show the company that you know, we're doing good work, that our BSD people are, are effective, and I think we're doing a good job of that. You know, we've got a relatively small number of people uh, versus the, the footprint and the impact of these systems, and I want to bring other people in the company into that fold and, and help them uh, use these tools to do the same. Um, and you know, how we'll do that, we want to empower our service owners to do cool stuff. You know, the, the base system, again, has, it's incredibly observable. You can, f you know, kind of figure out what it's doing and, and how you assemble it to, to make your, whatever you're trying to, to actually do, be efficient. Podrier and Package uh, are huge for developers, you know, when you're pulling in libraries or whatever. 
um, you don't get stuck on ancient versions or whatever. You have a ton of control in figuring out how you want to manage your dependencies in your programming language environments. And then SaltStack's also been massive. This is something we want to push as a self-service out to the groups that are doing product uh, development. Um, so that kind of, those four things are where we're at today. Where I'd like to go is uh, really kind of around jails and IO cage. Um, this is kind of stuff I've been playing around with on my own time, but what, what I think would be cool is to kind of detach the metal OS from the user land. So as a source team, we can start evolving this stuff that's touching the hardware faster than the product guys can, can validate their own changes. Um, the reason we want to do that is, you know, we, we're trying to test and, and minimize the amount of, of releases we have in production. So when we're doing driver work or whatever, these guys don't care too much about that. They just need it to work. But we need to keep their ABI compatible and everything. Um, so, for instance, I, you know, I, I can envision in the near future, uh, you know, in the next year or so, we'll want to start deploying 11 to production. And if we can do that without, you know, rebaking all of this user land stuff, that might be interesting for a mi uh, migration period, and you know you can support that for a couple years or whatever. Uh, ZFS is kind of instrumental to the Jails thing. You want to be able to push Jails around to work around uh, hardware problems or uh, you know data center migrations, things like that. Um, so I already mentioned this. We uh, this was actually a lot of work. Um, you know, in a corporate environment, you have to figure out how you can make people understand a good idea is like a good idea. Um, luckily, we had a founding engineer at the company that was able to help us uh, kind of make that case and uh, get, our, get our name up here. Um, so that's the end of my deck. And just the one thing I want to say is, you know, don't be afraid to push BSD to production in these type of roles. It's fine. A lot of people are doing it. Um, there's plenty of resources out there, plenty of mailing lists and, and things that you can go to to reach out for help. Um, and, and if you're doing this, I, I hope to see more talks about stuff like this because I think it's an important market segment that um, we're kind of quiet about right now.